happy after, uh, hope everyone's having a good afternoon. Um, let's start by, I guess, uh, uh, taking a, a roll call on the uh, previous minutes. Um, Sivan and Stephanie, um, do I have a, a motion and a second to approve the minutes from, from the last meeting or any, uh, any suggested changes? So moved. I, Sivan, I hear uh, uh, a move. Um, Stephanie, is there a second? Sure. Second. Beautiful. All right. Um, we are done with that then. Uh, so today's call um, uh, is basically just an extension of what we did uh, last time. And Sivan, I know you, you weren't there, but um, we are going to share that same spreadsheet from last time. And basically, we started going through all of the uh, license sites that we've talked about so far and attaching some fee numbers to them. Um, we kind of went through most of the license types. We'll go through the fees today. Um, this is all kind of building up to our, uh, our grand culmination of our, our time together, um, which I believe will be on Thursday where we'll have like final votes on some of this stuff. Um, and, and, uh, and so we can get ready for that report uh, that we need to put together quickly to get up to the legislature on, on fees and, and license types. So, um, Andrew, would you be able to uh, share the, the spreadsheet again? Sure thing, sure thing. And then, and then we'll dive right in. Um, Sivan, if you feel free to stop and interrupt, because I, I know we covered some of this last time, so if you need to, to get caught back up, but I don't think anything would um, surprise you with what we talked about, um, and then we'll kind of vote on the, on the things uh, next time. But um we basically created this spreadsheet the the two second rundown of it will be um we created the spreadsheet there's obviously a lot of uh variables and trying to figure out how to set up the fees in order to cover costs um so we we tried to do that with the spreadsheet um where we kind of created three different um three different dynamics based on uh potential uh interest in joining the uh in joining the market from from uh, entrepreneurs um, so that we could try to estimate like where fee revenue would be if there's a, a lot of demand to enter the market, you know, what we think will probably be there. And then even if in, in a bad situation where there aren't that many folks who are interested in starting businesses in Vermont. So that's what we did. And we also broke it down into two different sets of recommendations as we've talked about before. The first proposal being the one that we think these fees would get us to about um, about where the board would be covering their costs and able to pay back some of the information, uh, some of the um, money that has been uh, appropriated to them so far. And then uh, recommendation B or proposal B would be uh, like lower fees, uh, more in line with trying to get as many uh, small businesses into the market as possible. So um, that's basically what we've done. Um, and uh, unless anyone has Devon or Stephanie or anyone else has any questions like right off the bat, we can just kind of jump in and start uh, running through our uh, our fees um, and, and what we are and see where people feel on them and if they think they should be adjusted at all. Yeah, Dan, I'll, I'll hit you with a high level one just from looking at the minutes from last time from, from the meeting that I wasn't here yep. for. Um, talk me through the logic of the tiers uh, being so different in size for indoor versus outdoor and also in price. Um, so the the tiers being different, uh, we've generally been, uh, I guess for the out, starting with the outdoor uh, versus indoor tier differences, I think there's a, a couple reasons behind that. The first one being um, we've been thinking of outdoor cultivation, particularly as a um, a way to try to create more lower. Uh, barrier lower cost of entry licenses, um, which would probably tend to be smaller. Um, so we were thinking a lot of those would be um, uh, smaller farmers trying to uh, supplement their other uh, activities with, um, with with cannabis or um, some other smaller cultivation uh, individuals. Um, the second reason, and and we can adjust this if we think this is wrong, but. Uh, our model has been built on, um, you know, that you probably don't want too much of your supply to be um, in the outdoor market just because of uh, the nature of Vermont. You're only getting one grow season. Uh, most of your product is going to um, harvest time is going to come right when demand kind of plummets, uh, and you can you can extend that through the ski season. But 
it's still if too much of the Vermont market is outdoor um, without kind of figuring out how to adjust that demand, um, you, you could end up with a, an area where you have a, a surplus of products uh, in the in like the late autumn, early ski season, but before ski season really gets going, and then not uh, enough supply at other times in the year. So um, we that was our reasoning. There's no, uh, again, this is all, um, you know, we're all just trying to figure out how best to suit this to fit the Vermont market. So um, if you have thoughts about adjusting those uh, tier sizes, I'm happy to. Well, yeah, I guess I also want... just, oh, sorry. Yeah, second, or, just wanna... Let me finish my one, one thought. Okay, that, go for it. The same reasoning is also basically behind the, um, the, the fees. Uh, indoor facilities are more expensive. Um, and so we thought that you could probably have higher um, higher uh, fee totals there, um, especially if you're trying to cover costs. And if we're trying to create outdoor cultivation as uh, an entry level way to get into the market for folks who might not be sitting on uh, millions of dollars of capital, um, we wanted to keep those fees um, substantially lower than the, than the indoor facilities. Um, I think Andrew was going to say something, and then I think we have a question from the um, from the main room. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Dan. Um, I was going to say, you know, it's like these were just what we initially rolled out. We absolutely can go with, you know, if people think uh, 1,000, 2,500, and 5,000 is is better, or 1,000, 3,000, and 6,000 is better. It's you know not really holding fast to anything on that regard. Uh, and I do also know that um, you know Brent had mentioned and that it may be optimal to actually have an outdoor growing option that's just under an acre um, in order to um, kind of some reduce the potential bureaucratic um, I I issues that could arise with, with larger growth, particularly, you know, wanting to keep smaller ones. So uh, we could absolutely set, you know, do something and looking at it at 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, or, you know, whatever we want. It, at this point, uh, we can create more tiers at a certain point, obviously, creating a huge amount of tiers makes things overly complicated. Um, but I think that we'll probably add one or two more uh, without too much issue. And I think there's a question in the, uh, in the room. Yeah, yeah, sorry, it's James Pepper. More of a programming note. Um, we got a public comment, I think, that when you screen share, we can't see who's talking. And so for the people in the room that don't spend quite as much time with you all. Um, if you could just say your name when you talk. I, I think we've been good on it so far, but um, it would just help the people in the room know who's speaking when there's a screen share happening. Yeah, definitely we'll do that. This is Dan. Uh, and uh, Sivan, you had a question? Uh, yeah, so this is Sivan talking. Um, just to, to finish this point, um, I, I, I guess I would, I would kick it to the board to discuss what they want to be encouraging or not. I totally respect that we want to try to manage away from you know, huge oversupply gluts at one point in time. Um, but my gut says that uh, there will be a lot of disappointed Vermonters if they find out that outdoor can't be more than 10,000 square feet. Um, so I, I think we want to think about what the expectations are and, and, and uh, what we want as a state where if a lot of farmers are looking at, hey, I can take my field over there and repurpose it, and this is gonna be a nice thing to mix in with you know, the other things I farm anyway. And you know, one field is probably already gonna be way larger than 10,000 square feet of canopy. Maybe not, I, maybe I don't have the right sense of this um, from a gut. Um, but uh, th 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 that strikes me as not what I expected. But I think that's really a question to the board um, as to what they do or don't want to encourage. Oh, well, I actually have a question on this too, um, and sorry to interrupt the actual subcommittee, but um, you know, if we're thinking that uh, Vermont outdoor is kind of a one harvest per year, and yet indoor is kind of three to four, I know sometimes you know folks do five, but if it's three to four, shouldn't there be some kind of like uh, ratio there that makes sense, like a one thousand? indoor is equivalent to a 4,000 outdoor or 3,000? You know, and that's just a question. I, I don't know the answer to that or if it, ma if it matters. So there are, yeah. yeah, there's differences in production as well. 
Um, but uh, and indoor growers typically, as I've seen it, if you're only getting three a year, it's it's, it's not. It's uh, you're probably under produ producing. So it's more like you know, uh, four and a half to five and a half. Um, but yeah, I mean, we can absolutely adjust these, uh, both the tier sizes and the fees. These were just kind of initial proposals. And yeah, I agree we can do that. Some of this uh, for fee proposals, we were uh, walking a little backwards from the statutory mandate, um, seeing what number we had to get uh, to cover costs and, and then um, and figuring it out from there. So uh, we, that was kind of our, our uh, main goal was to make sure that we covered costs, especially in this uh, fee recommendation one. But we can try to adjust that uh, using a different ratio um, and, and kind of come up with uh, slightly different fees. Um, and the other option, uh, and sorry, this is Dan. I forgot to announce myself. I, I failed on your one your one <laughs> request on my first opportunity. Um, and then the, uh, the other thing is that I, I think I'm totally, I think our team would be um, happy with um, we could create other larger tiers uh, that's possible. One of the things that we could do, and as you've seen, um, Sivan, we didn't really talk about it, I don't think, on, on calls before when you were on, but uh, some of the larger tiers for uh, indoor and outdoor, we were going to basically put in the, um, give the board the authority to expand to those tiers uh, if certain benchmarks are needed or if they're needed. Uh, basically building out of your comment from, I think, our very first meeting where we're not really sure what the um, what the the market dynamics are going to be here, and if there's a whole bunch of people who want to cultivate, if there if there's if maybe we're overestimating it, so we're going to try we're going to like create up license types that uh, of larger tiers that if the uh, overwhelming amount of small cultivators doesn't materialize, and we can see that through that um, intent to apply provisional license process that we that we've talked about before. Uh, then it would allow the board to expand and, and uh, allow for larger tiers right off the start. Um, we, that's something we could probably put in uh, an, uh, some additional tiers um, that may not be issued right away uh, on the first license, um, uh, but the board could have the authority to, to do so if it seems like demand isn't going to be met by the supply or, um, and, you know, and always allowing uh companies to grow as they uh if they get settled at a lower tier obviously provide them uh room to grow and expand as they uh as they succeed and uh and grow so um does that seem like a thing that we should uh adjust and we can start we have we saved this whole call to just talk about this so we can walk through some of that here now or or uh if you want us to just kind of come up with another proposal and share it before Thursday's meeting to vote on. Uh, either way, whatever the board uh, feels comfortable with or whatever the subcommittee feels comfortable with, sorry. Hi, Dan and Andrew, this is Kyle. I, I have a question. Mixed light greenhouses, yep. are those, are, was, are, you, are you couching those under our indoor cultivation category here? I know in some states they have their own license type. So I don't know, Andrew. Do you want to um, talk about your? Uh... Oh, sorry. As Kyle, this is Andrew here. Kyle, as soon as you you said mixed light greenhouses, my Wi-Fi went a little down. I, I missed your question. Would you mind repeating it? Sorry. For that. Yeah, no, no problem at all. <clears throat> and thinking just through how I'd imagine there might be some some folks trying to utilize mixed light greenhouses here. I didn't know if you were you were covering that grow concept in your indoor cultivation like yeah. steering okay just wanted to make sure yeah so so um i, I think i mentioned this uh, time or two ago um, <laughs> the way that we're really differentiating indoor versus greenhouse or outdoor is whether or not the flowering plants are getting a uh, a light cycle that is different from the normal you know, rise and set of the sun. So right. you could very well have, you know, veg plants that you do indoors or under light depth greenhouse and then put just, you know, once you start flowering, you only flower outside. And that would be considered, you know, outdoor greenhouse. If you're doing a light deprivation greenhouse in which 
you know, sometimes you are augmented with, with additional lights, sometimes you're blacking the greenhouse out. That's essentially equivalent to um, indoor as far as um, production cycles are occurring. And what you're just essentially doing is you're lowering your electricity bills by utilizing the sun during those times when the sun matches up with when your lights would normally be on. Um, gotcha. So yeah. light depth greenhouse would count as indoor, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. Just wanted to make sure I understood where they were covered in your estimations here. Yeah. Does that work? I mean, I, I, we could try um, to, to come up with another tier of mixed light. Um, I, I, it's, it would be hard to, I think, project, or I don't know, I won't speak yeah. to Andrew, maybe he can project. Um, but uh, would, is that something the board or the subcommittee would be interested in us, like creating it as a separate, um, a separate tier? I don't think. Oh, go ahead, and, and I was just going to say that um, th this makes sense to me as presented in that I also assume that an indoor grow is more than one harvest. And so if we draw the line there, th that makes sense regardless of mixed light greenhouse <laughs> or, you know, like all those other um, terms. I think it, it just, you know, it makes sense. Outdoor is using natural light, likely one harvest and indoor is multiple harvests over the course of the year. We'd be happy to, to work with you. This is Andrew here again. This be happy to work with you on, on specifically uh, writing how would that you know the regulatory definition would have to be for the differentiation there. I know that California does have different license tiers for mixed light, but um, California also has way too many different license types. It's just gets. I can see I can see Jeff laughing. Uh, it's uh, it, it gets a little cumbersome. I think probably both for regulators as well as for business owners. Yeah, I wasn't trying to hijack the conversation. I just, I just wanted to make sure I understood where, where we were drawing no lines and what, how things. No, 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 no. It's a great work. question. Yeah, from a board yeah, perspective. The first time in. Oh, sorry. From a board perspective, I think uh, just having a clear definition and not adding that license type would be, would be my preference. So I have uh, right now. I think we'll. So I think we'll adjust for the outdoor tiers um, to do to, to adjust that uh, to adjust the tier to make sure that there's uh, it aligns with the the number of square feet uh, in in an acre um, for some of the land review uh, to to. To streamline that with some of the other uh, laws in the state and, and some of the land re review with uh, ag issues that I'm sure Andrew uh, probably knows better than I do. Um, and that will also probably build out um, maybe another one or two outdoor tiers um, to allow for higher uh, outdoor um, canopy, either immediately upon uh, licensure or uh, um, uh, at the board's discretion, um, when when needed, when there's growth, or or when uh, more demand is needed, does that sound um, right for the tier types? This is Andrew here. I think that that I, I agree with that, Dan. I think that another thing we should do, and if you make note of this, is there shouldn't be a difference in the square footage size between the different. Uh, you know, maybe indoor will have a one larger you know, delayed tier type, but I don't think it makes sense to have, you know, 1,000, 3,000, 6,000 for outdoor, and then like 1,000, 2,500, and 5,000 for indoor. I think it just is unnecessarily confusing. Yeah, that, I think that's good. And then and then once we align those properly, uh, then we can actually just readjust the fees based on um, kind of that ratio uh, that the, the chair was talking about um, to, to just have a more uh, reasonable uh, and defendable fee structure, um, but I think I'd still probably. Um, I think you've seen it both here. We've we've made that lowest tier even on this fee recommendations A, which are um, you know built to meet the the costs. We still tried to make sure that that lowest tier was 
uh, quite affordable uh, from a fee perspective just to keep those costs down. So we'll probably build that ratio for like the rest of the tiers, but try to keep those first ones um, uh, like disproportionately low, I guess, uh, since it's all uh, all a ratio, I guess, with the other fees. Um, but does that does that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I would so, yeah. I would add or support or clarify that uh, I think less tiers is better. So. I would agree with okay. that. So you, you know, should, I, yeah, I, we can simplify I, I, I would them as well. Go yeah. Under one thousand, under five thousand, under ten thousand, instead of one, three, six, ten. Indoor can be under one thousand, under five thousand, and under. You know, like you, you could remove part of these tiers, right? Instead of going indoor, what we've got under one, yeah. 25, 5, 10, 25,000, yeah. 50,000. You could literally just have 1,000, 5,000, 15,000, 50,000, you know, or, you know, take your pick, right? But I think yeah. uh, this is more tiers than, than we probably need. Thanks, Yvonne. This is Andrew here. Uh, we hear you there, and absolutely, uh, I think we could structure them in a way that uh, would be uh, that request as well as the desire to get at least um, another tier right below that 4,300 square feet. So, thanks. Um, all right, sounds good. And then the, I guess the only other question I have about um, the cultivation license tiers and fees. Uh, is are there any uh, subcommittee thoughts on kind of this model where where a couple of the larger tiers would be delayed? It was basically to prevent, to to create an opportunity for smaller businesses to to get their foot in, but also provide that safety valve if they aren't able to supply the market to allow bigger companies to uh, to come in. Um, I, I think it's a, a good. Uh, a valuable concept um, for like um, so. Uh, is there any objection to that, or is that um, that's unnecessary? We just want to. We. This is Chris Walsh. I I think it's a smart move to delay some of the bigger canopies. I I support it. This is Sivan. I also support it, um, but with the caveat that uh, we just need to be really certain that we are going to make it easy for people to step up in size. So, for example. You know, if we're saying that we're going to delay 50,000 for indoor, but someone who's interested in doing 50,000 wants to start by building themselves 25,000, or by building a facility that they anticipate to eventually be able, capable of doing 50,000, but only growing 25 until they're allowed to step up, that that should be totally reasonable and plausible, and should not be something we're discouraging. So, you know, as long as we're going to be able to help people uh, scale up when we deem that acceptable, uh, I'm full support. Yeah, I think that um, is probably either for future future calls or, or another subcommittee. But I think our thought would be that it would be, you know, if you can show demand, if you can show demand for your product, you can you can expand. You know, you can, when you come up for renewal later down the down the road. Um, so let let whoever's thriving in the market um, continue to to grow and expand if they can. Um, it also provides the the board some some tools to. Um, you know, make sure that they have uh, enough enough supply to, to cover the demand of the state. So, um, so uh, turning, I guess, because uh, it will still be cultivation, but the one which you won't see here are the um, the existing businesses, which are called the integrated licenses. So we, uh, in this proposed fifty thousand dollars as a as a fee. Um, partly because we were trying to account for the fact that in statute there's already a fifty thousand dollar fee um, that would go to the, um, the the social equity fund, um, so it would be a hundred thousand uh, dollar annual fee right off the bat, um, but only fifty thousand uh, dollars kind of in perpetuity. So um, we we're trying to balance that initial that initial. Uh, upfront cost um, for kind of how big their current facilities are. Um, it's, but open to thoughts from the subcommittee on whether that's too low, too high. Um, we also wanted to just try to keep it aligned with what we have generally here, which are we tried to keep pretty low fees overall. Um, there's, there's no fees where we tried to tried to go too high. So um, let uh, I guess I'll open it up for, for discussion. 
um, if anyone has thoughts on, on whether it's high or low. This is Sivan. Um, you know, we've compared many things to alcohol regulatory policy in Vermont, and compared to that, these fees are astronomically high. I'm not saying they're unfair, um, but you know, alcohol licenses in Vermont, you pay a thousand dollars for a manufacturing license, whether you are distilling, you know, a hundred cases a year or twenty thousand cases a year, um, and uh, I, I think that when people see these, there might be a reaction that uh, they're getting double taxed. I, I'm not saying that's right or wrong, but I think a lot of people might look at this and say, hey, if we sell a lot, that's going to have tax on it, right? There's already going to be excess taxes and sales taxes. So that already is tied to how big or small we are. But now you're also saying the license itself could be another 50 grand. I, I think some, some Vermonters might gripe that this is not in keeping with how we've approached other things that, that might be analogous. That being said, we're also still constrained by statute. The statute says that these licenses have to be sufficient to pay for the CCB. So uh, you know that, that that's a tough balancing act, but it's at least something that I would put on the radar that we probably should be prepared to expect. This is Stephanie. What are our question? Um, states doing Maine and I mean, we had we saw that before, I guess, but it doesn't compare. Yeah. I can pull it up. Um, I mean, I think these are still lower than, um, I mean, you know, you see it's obviously a totally different market, but like the, the fees that were required in like Illinois for the existing businesses are on a, a you know, many standards, uh, totally different plane from these. These are still much lower than those. Um, I can pull, I don't remember what we, we copied or we didn't copy, but we were informed on a lot of this stuff by, uh, by Maine, and we tried to look at like Maine and, and uh, Alaska and some of the other more rural, um, uh, smaller market states. Uh, give me a second, I'll try to open up that spreadsheet because um, I don't remember exactly what uh, Maine did, but I don't think Maine had the same exact. Uh, um, I only, I just bring this up just in terms of like who's adjacent to us because again, in the hemp program, it's always like, well, I'll go to the other state because it's done different there yeah <laughs> that's nearby and so I, I was just thinking in terms of, of that um, where, where someone can easily relocate possibly um, or start a business in a different state yeah I'm sorry I should have I, I don't have the spreadsheet open and I can't remember off the top of my head what the what the fees were but I feel like we when we're coming up with these we try to inform them all by being like around where not outliers with any uh, without any with any of the um, uh, kind of comparable states um, where a significant outlier below or Vermont would be a significant outlier below some of the um, much larger states but it, as it should be um, like it, it, the, the value of this license is going to be the same as the you know the limited license in, in Illinois or something so um, I will um, uh, it's good to hear that that's yeah. been considered I just wanted to yeah, sorry, and I'm kind of fumbling because I can't get this. That's okay, you don't bring it up now. Uh, is there, is yeah, there any other Jennifer, industry in Vermont that the fees are tied to operating um, budgets? Uh, fish and wildlife, I think. I forget. Medical dispensaries. <coughs> Uh, I guess, yes, yeah, so, I mean, that's the, that addresses, like, I can't imagine that there's, well, I don't, I guess I don't know, but um, it seems like there's more costs here that are going to have to be covered by these license fees according to what's required in statute than in other industries uh, in, in Vermont. Um, so that's going to be the answer to some, somewhat why these, uh, these fees are higher than we see in other, other, other um, industry areas. Sivan? Yep, uh, this is Sivan. Um, just adding on my previous comment, clearly my previous comment was only about the cultivators. Um, I didn't comment at all about the, the retail license types. I just want to add, I think the retail license types look exactly what one would probably expect for Vermont. Looking at, you know, storefront and all, uh, that pricing all looks totally reasonable. Great. Um, do we want to turn to, I guess, was there any other thoughts on, on integrated? I can. 
uh, try to pull some information and see where, where this fits in with like other existing businesses transferring in. I think it's, uh, I, again, can't find it all right in front of me. And I'm, Andrew, I don't know if you, this is the sort of yeah. thing that you might know off the top of your head, but I feel like if you compare those uh, to other states, this yeah, is but, low, I, but again, yeah. it's probably it's still an outlier with Vermont just because of how Vermont's fees tend to be yeah. very low on everything. I did just pull them up though, and um, Dan, I will I will share them with you. It just took me a second to find this specific regulatory section in for Maine. Um, but yeah, and I need to check what the size of their cultivation facilities are. But I'm looking at it right now, and like their outdoor is like you know 1,500, 5,000, 15,000, and their outdoor for the different this is like tier three, two, three, and four is 3,000, 10,000, and 30,000. Um, so those seem pretty similar, um, to be honest. Um, but I'm gonna, I'll, I'll find this out, Dan, I'll send it to you. Yeah. Um, so uh, if we don't have any other questions on, on that, um, uh, let's, I guess, go to the, the retail, um, uh, fees. Um, are there uh, thoughts on that? Again, we tried to have that, um, you know, a, a ratio um, somewhat there. So obviously the fees go down quite a bit depending on how, uh, like, the likely value and expense of each license. Um, Chris, I see that you have a question. Yeah, um, just my feedback I, I think all the retail licenses are a little bit on the lower low side and that they could go up um and there's really no listing of re like are you doing renewals at, at or is the idea of renewal would be at a different rate or we, would that be the same every year sorry yeah this is all um these are all the uh, license fee and renewal fee. So this would be the same fee every year. Yeah, I, I would recommend at least for the retail storefront that your initial year would be higher than five and then maybe renewals coming down after you've proven yourself. Chris, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, the, the logic you have there? Um, you, you know, I, I've looked at some of the other states, um, you know, we're not that far off, but I would, um, I would think that a year one for a retail storefront in our state, um, I just feel that it, it should be higher than 5,000. That's just my opinion. And these, and, um, yeah, like for, for input, these these do vary widely um, uh, among states, uh, the, the license fees there. Like I think, um, you know, in like Michigan, uh, you know, I think Michigan, Nevada, I think they're up at like 20,000, 25,000. Uh, I think Massachusetts, Jen, correct me, is it is it 10,000? Yeah, 10, 10, I believe. Yeah. Um, but then there are Makes states, sense. like I think, I think this is one where we tried to um, balance it because I think Maine is only uh, 2,500. Um, yeah, no, so we're, we were like we we're like trying to aim low end of range, um, but I mean these are things that that are. Uh, the, I guess my one question, Chris, to you um, uh, would be: Do you think there's any? So one of our concerns, I think, that's kind of run through our thought is that um, other once you get outside of um, Burlington and some of the other markets that it could be hard to make um, storefront work with with smaller populations. Um, do you think higher fees there would kind of limit the amount of uh, the amount of uh, like people who would be interested in storefront in I guess places that could potentially handle uh, handle some some retailers but but aren't big markets. Uh, I'm realizing that big market is relative uh, when talking about Vermont, but I mean, I think that's where the sort of limited uh, retail license would work in a maybe a smaller town where uh, a dedicated brick and mortar, regardless of the license fee, may not support your rent and uh, your build out 
So that's, you know, the, the, the limited retail, I think, would work there. <clears throat> I'm not talking about, like, tripling the amount. I just feel that you could go slightly higher as the initial license for storefront retail and then maybe have a $5,000 renewal. Okay. And again, for at least for this set of fee recommendations, um, you know, we're trying to get to that like uh, 1.6, 1.7 million. So if we increase the storefront amount, we can lower um, some of the low level outdoor cultivation or other other fees uh, commensurate. Um, Sivan? Yeah, uh, this is Sivan, of course. Um, I, just sticking to that previous idea, I, I would be a little concerned about having a higher fee um, in the first year and, and lower later. Um, I, cause I, I want us to avoid um, falling into a preconceived bias that only Burlington will have full storefronts and you know other places that aren't Burlington or Burlington like will only have you know limited license in corners of general stores. Because there's a, a lot of in between throughout Vermont. You know, I, mean, I, I live in Virgins. Virgins is a tiny, it's technically a city, but it's 2,000 people, it's two, it's two square miles, it's tiny. Right, but we're the hub and spoke of our part of Addison County, and there's a couple other towns, and we have a vibrant Main Street that goes a couple blocks in downtown. I could totally picture, you know, what is currently our small CBD shop that does exist on Main Street, instead being a small cannabis shop, and that would be a normal full, full storefront license, right? And there's a lot of places like in Vermont like that where I think it is the intent, where you have local select boards who voted and said we're going to allow, and they expect there's going to be some dedicated store there, not some corner of a general store. Maybe it will also be the latter. But um, so I don't think we want to discourage application types um, just by just thinking, oh, big markets like Burlington can sustain storefront, others can't. And you know, I think a lot of places could do a small storefront that they are going to make work in a smaller town, because they're going to be you know, a mom and pop owned, you know, one or two employees and a small retail, you know, small square footage and not have that high rent and they probably will make that work. And I think that is what a lot of people are imagining in Vermont. So I don't think, I think we want to be careful about something that will economically discourage that from happening. Chris, is your hand still up or is that your, or is that a, another comment or is that a response? No, no, it's my disobedient. I can <laughs> um, Stephanie, do you want to weigh in on this at all? Uh, and again, like I think one of the good parts of this whole process is that uh, the again, these are recommendations to the board and the board's listening in. So uh, all of, no matter what we uh, recommend here, uh, they they have heard each individual recommendation. But Stephanie, since it seems like we have a couple of disagreements on our three person board, do you have a um, Thoughts. Um, I do think actually, I was um, in Savan's comments. I was just, I, I think, likewise, I think there'll be a number of small um, storefronts fully dedicated, sprinkled throughout the state of Vermont. Um, I don't think it'll be limited just to Burlington. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention that I heard Chris Walsh say was a separate renewal fee that's lower than the initial fee. I, I think that might be confusing. I think it'd be better just to have a consistent fee. You know, it's just an annual fee. You pay the same thing every year, and then everybody can budget, including the cannabis control board, <laughs> um, can budget based on those numbers. Um, and I guess they could budget based on less as well. But this just seems a little more um, sturdy. Uh, so that's. I don't have any additional comments beyond that. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think. Um, can I That's, just add one thing? Yeah. Sorry. The one thing, uh, the one thing that it's important to think about, uh, and, I, and I said this earlier today in the compliance and enforcement subcommittee meeting, is that while this committee is looking directly at fees and, and how it cover the cost of the board, I'm not sure the board yet knows what those costs are if enforcement comes under them or staffing levels. And I know you have to go back to the legislature, but just keep in mind that there's a many different facets of regulatory structure that have to be accounted for that we may not be thinking of at this moment in time. 
because that will definitely be affected by any decisions that are made. Yeah, I, I think all of these are, um, we have a lot of projections in here trying to figure out exactly how uh, how, they, how this budget will work out. Um, but that's well, kind of, a lot of a lot of our job here was to to try to try to estimate as best we can kind of how this will be. And again, I guess the most um, helpful thing to think about through all of this is that I think we're putting together a good set of uh, recommendations on all of this, and I think we're uh, as a group have worked through a lot of the questions and issues of how this will work in Vermont and how this will kind of affect uh, the unique uh, nature of Vermont and how it will help um, have uh, um, Vermont. Uh, kind of embrace its culture and, and try to create a cannabis market that looks a little different than some of the other states. But uh, the board will end up having the power to, to try to adjust or, or, or fix as, as, we, uh, as we go forward. As I don't think there's been a single um, uh, cannabis uh, regulatory system in the country that hasn't gone back and uh, after their first go at it, made some changes, saw what was working, saw what wasn't working and tried to try to improve it and make it better for everyone. So, um, you know, if we, uh, we, all of this will be subject to, to future um, edits if we need to. I see, I see a hand in the like bubble of other participants. So I, I don't know who, who that is, but if somebody has a, a question or a comment, um, feel free to jump in. Maybe not, maybe that's still, Maybe it's still Chris's hand. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to take it down. Oh, I, there we go. Yeah, no worries. It's got it's gone now. Yeah, I saw when it was on your when it was on your icon. I knew it was you, but then it went to the to the bubble of uh, other participants. Um, so, I think the last couple things that I want to hit before we um, before we wrap up um, and, and go to public comment, if there is any. Um, are the, uh, does like the ratio for manufacturing uh, license fees seem to work for everybody? Um, and for the overall rate, all, we can adjust all these a little bit when, um, once we redo the outdoor and indoor cultivation tiers, but um, does that kind of ratio work? This is Simon, and I'd say they seem to make sense. And, you know, re reading the minutes from the last session, you know, I, I, I note that kind of danger is the line of demarcation between the two types, and I think with that framework in mind, the price difference here is totally appropriate. Um, sounds good. Um, so then, I, I guess turning to our um, again, so. I guess we'll pause on, on substance for a second while I just run through like where I, I think how I'll envision this going forward. I think next meeting, um, before the next meeting, we'll, we'll send out to um, the subcommittee members kind of our revised list of fees and, and license types um, so that uh, for final review um, that I think we'll recommend to the board. Um, and then on that meeting, we will uh, vote on those uh, as a recommendations of the subcommittee. Um, I think there'll be a few other uh, questions that I'll put to the board next week as well, um, basically confirming some of the things that we've talked about in here on like the responsibility of those license types and what different licenses can do. Like for instance, um, uh, Chris, Sivan, you missed this, but Chris brought up a good point on the last call that you know the retail license should be uh, the storefront retail license should also have the power to sell seeds and clones. Like you shouldn't need both licenses. So we'll have those also up for votes that I think we kind of already, um, as a subcommittee, talked about and agreed on. Um, but so that's I think the they're going to be the process uh, for next call. Um, so for the last couple minutes here before we check for um, public comment, um, I just wanted to say that we had a a second fee recommendation here that just had. Um, lower fees uh, mm -hmm. based on try to keep a similar ratio but based on the fact that these current fees are the ones that statutorily are um, meet what we think let me start over 
if if we get the license numbers that we think we might get in Vermont based on these fees, it should be enough for the board to cover costs um, and with a little bit of excess so that they can pay back the deficit over 10 years. Um, so that's kind of where these fees came from. So once we even adjust for these outdoor cultivations, we'll probably play with the numbers a little bit to make sure that um, that they still cover the fees. But we have this second 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 set of recommendations where we're going to just recommend fees that we think um, are are reasonable, um, where we can maybe go down a little bit. It sounds like um, there's not that much, or uh, it doesn't sound like. Actually, I'll turn it back rather than rather than assuming what the subcommittee thinks. Um, are there any places here um, where you think these fees are just generally too high and that we should lower them for our kind of like uh, recommendations that aren't tied to the statutory requirements? Um, Sivan, I see that your hands up. Um, so maybe you can go first. Yep. Yeah, this is Sivan. Um, to the question I think we're trying to get to, Dan, um, looking at all these fees, accepting that you guys are going to rejigger a little bit when you change the number of categories, these fees all look reasonable. So if the committee agrees, um, then I don't know that we need to be pursuing uh, an alternative approach that has reduced fees and is asking the legislature to provide tax revenue to cover that reduction because these already look pretty reasonable. They, they don't look like anything I think would, you know, lead to people, you know, running with pitchforks and, and you know, being upset. So. Yeah, I was think like if we were to, to propose lower fees, I think um, we were trying to have the fees disproportionately lowered for the low entry licenses. Again, to just like that's probably where if you're building a you know a, a, a ten thousand square foot indoor facility, like you probably have some um, you know some capital available to to pay the to the fee. But if you're trying to be a small outdoor cultivator, you know, we want to be cognizant that you may not be sitting on the uh, a huge bank account. Um, any other thoughts from from Chris or Stephanie um, or anyone else on the call about um, kind of that? And we'll just rework these and, and send you guys copies of the latest proposal based on all of your feedback um, for the uh, for the call on Thursday. Dan, I've got one more. Uh, this is Sivan again. Oh, Sivan, and then I yeah, Sivan, and then I see somebody in the uh, in the main room. So Sivan. Um, just just a comment for the record. I'm assuming that uh, in addition to these few recommendations, we're still expecting uh, separate recommendations from the social equity subcommittee um, that would be speaking to how some of these licenses would be uh, further uh, reduced um, for people who meet certain categories. So it, it just. Stating that again, that's a working yes. assumption I think we all have, but just making sure it's still out there for this discussion. Yeah, sorry, I should have reiterated. I, I kind of said that at the beginning of this discussion at the start of the last call, the social equity uh, committee is working on uh, reducing some fees and, and eliminating some license fees and things along those lines. I've been fully up on where they are exactly landing, but these would then be kind of merged with those. So um, uh, yeah, for social equity applicants, these would be lowered. Uh, there's a question in the in the boardroom. Yeah, uh, this is James Pepper. Um, uh, there was an open question, I think, last meeting about whether the testing labs that were um, certified and paid their fees through the hemp program would need to pay an additional fee uh, to be part of the cannabis. Um, so if that could be just on the table for discussion next week. Um, and it doesn't make a huge difference to the budget, it looks like, but it just uh, be, just want to get kind of some clarification on that. And then we do have to make a recommendation on delivery. And I think that, you know, depending on how that delivery looks, uh, and I know the social equity caucus is, or the social equity subcommittee is, is thinking about this, um, you know, like how that compares to some of the other retail fees. Um, I think if we're going to make a recommendation to the legislature, it should a company, it should be accompanied by a fee um, amount, a recommended fee amount as well. So um, it's something that maybe, you know, Dan, we should work with you offline on, um, but I just, I don't want that, I know that it impacts kind of 
the viability of a retail location, depending on which way you go, and, and maybe that should be a consideration in the fee structure here. Yeah, definitely. I can I can follow up on the um, I'll follow up to the on delivery piece, and uh, we can work on that uh, on the uh, testing lab thing. I actually meant to bring that up. I, we were gonna. Uh, I think I I was gonna follow up with um, the Stephanie and, and just. I think my thoughts and I, let me know. I know we're running late, but I, I think we're gonna recommend figuring out, however, to align the costs with the the cost for the labs uh, for the hemp program. And I think we want to attract labs to the state and not make it more difficult. So if you can be accredited, if you're if you basically will have one time fee if possible for uh, and it can cover hemp and uh, adult use cannabis, provided you hit the norm, the required. Um, uh, you know, quality assurance uh, procedures and things like that. But I don't think we should be trying to raise too much extra revenue on the back of labs because I think the state's going to want to have uh, labs so that there's no testing backlogs and other problems. And I think uh, Chris brought up a good point that one thing that we should definitely recommend is that allow those labs to um, to test uh, home grow and, and try to create a different revenue source for them as well so that they don't um, just have to test for I uh, well, like a lot of the home cultivators to use them to to quality to do quality assurance on their own on their own grows. So um, I think those are things that we recommend. Yeah, uh, currently there's no prohibition of any lab, whether certified by the Agency of Agriculture, to test hemp or not. To I mean, they can take in samples from whomever they're willing to take samples from. So we don't we don't have a prohibition currently. Um, even though there's probably cannabis going to maybe some of our labs, <laughs> so just it's already happening. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Maybe the recommendation will then just be like, don't impose a new prohibition uh, and make it clear that they yeah. Um, but I want to, uh, unless there's any last questions, I don't know if there's. Uh, I know we normally want to pause around now to see if there's any public comment. But uh, Stephanie, you have one more question. I just have one clarification on the wholesaler license. Um, is that kind of like a, I mean, an aggregator of products that are already labeled? And uh, well, I guess I, I would like a definition. I guess is what I'm looking for. Yeah, I, I think that the clearest definition is that you can purchase from other licensees and sell to other licensees, but you're, you can't sell, uh, you can't produce your own products or, or sell directly to consumers. Um, uh, part of the reason why it's a low license is that a uh, low fee is that uh, in the statute a lot of the that ability is built into the existing license types. Um, uh, so um, this would be like if somebody was not like a cultivator wouldn't need to get this license additionally, um, but if somebody didn't want to, um, you know, would, would just wanted to be. Uh, on whole, in the wholesale required. It also wouldn't be required. I know an alcohol uh, wholesale level is required. It would not be uh, required to go through uh, through a wholesaler. Um, yeah. And so somebody one that place would, where, uh, Stephanie again, one place someone who wanted to white label products, that's probably not entertained in this. I would think that the white label, and again, we, we haven't ironed out every definition here, but our vision, I think, uh, was that the, a white labeling would probably be um, like a tier two manufacturing license. Um, uh, and that's why we're trying to keep those low low cost uh, as much as possible. And in kind of in a fee proposal B where we're going lower, we'd probably move those even, uh, maybe even a little bit lower, because that would be a good entry level license for, for folks who are, um, you know, trying to get into this market, but don't have the capital to set up a a full um, cultivation facility or, or a full uh, manufacturing facility. If the board was interested, I think you could probably define these in different ways and, and have different licenses do different things, but you just want to make sure that you kind of define them all so that they fit together so that there's not any licenses that are kind of useless because everyone has that power or, um, you know, or else way uh, or in like another way where you you know your fee isn't aligned with what the what the economic value is for that license in the market. Chris, sorry, I was muted. Um, just to get clarity again, so wholesale, you don't need wholesale if you have a cultivation license, but you also do not need wholesale if you're 
either of the manufacturing tiers? Uh, correct. I, I mean, I, I'll should d double check on the statute, but it, it looked uh, like the definitions of those of manufacturing and of cultivation in the statute included uh, like the ability to wholesale. But I will I will definitely double check that before the next call, unless anyone has that uh, knows that right off the top of their head. But it seemed like that's where it was in the statute. Um, Sivan. Yeah, I, I, I expect that we will see wholesalers. Um, it, it's good that, that uh, you know, manufacturers and, and cultivators can sell directly to storefronts, but I anticipate that we will see wholesalers from existing wholesalers in other industries in Vermont, you know, whether it's Farrell who sells a lot of beer in Vermont, or it's Rhino Foods who delivers produce and, and a bunch of other stuff like that, you know. There are a number of existing Vermont wholesalers uh, in other industries that I wouldn't be surprised if they choose to apply for you know, this as what they would think of as maybe as an add, add on to their business. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what our, like, we wanted the vision to be and, and what we're thinking is that it's, we want to make it a license that it, it can, it can help, you know, if you're a cultivator and you don't want to have to deal with, uh, you know, moving your product around, you can just focus on what you do best and, and get a wholesaler to do that. Um, but what we didn't want to do was um, create a, uh, you know, that's why, but we wanted to not price it out of the market, you know, by having too high of fees where, uh, you know, you might use a wholesaler uh, if it's there, but if you, but there might not be as big of a margin for the wholesalers if the, if, if the fees are super high. Um, any other questions, Chris? Is that another question or did, I didn't see your hand go down before it went back up, so I don't know if, uh, if you're just still enthusiastic I'm, or- uh, I'm good with questions, sorry about- uh, <laughs> No worries. Always being unruly. Um, uh, is there any, I, let's just, I know we only have two minutes left. Is there any public comment, um, in the, in the room today? Yeah, we, we do have, uh, at least one person with public comment. Hi, it's, uh, Dave Silverman. I'll try to be very quick. Uh, first on, on wholesalers, uh, the statute, uh, does permit wholesalers to both process and package products. So, uh, you know, there was a question on, uh, you know, kind of white labeling and things like that. So I, th I think, you know, there will be some of that uh, and that's in the statute, uh, but it doesn't allow manufacturing or production of products, just processing and packaging. Um, on fees, uh, you know, overall, I, I really like what I see. I, I really like the low fees at the low levels, ease, ease of entry into the marketplace. Um, I, I agree uh, with Chris. Uh, that the, the retail fee seems a little low uh, or lower than it could be. Um, you know, uh, $5,000, uh, when, when you break it down into what it is these guys are selling, it's about, I don't know, three and a half pounds of, of their wholesale input. Um, it's not very much. Um, I, I do like that the seeds and clones license fee is, is nice and low. Um, Integrated licenses, you know, when I think about integrated licenses, it, it is one license that allows the, all, all the activities of all the other license types, and it doesn't make sense to me that the integrated licenses don't cost at least the sum of all the other license fees. So, you know, if you take a look at, uh, you know, a 25,000 square foot indoor grow and a retail storefront, uh, and a tier one manufacturer and a wholesaler and a testing lab, I get to 67,000 at this proposal. So it seems like 50 is a little low um, on that front. And it doesn't really make sense to me to have it be anything other than the sum of, of all. It, it would even make sense to have the sum of all plus a little more in the first year to reflect the fact that they have this exclusive sales period. Um, but that may be a, a political question that's beyond the scope of this committee. Uh, but certainly the sum of the fees is the only logical approach I can think of. Um, and I thank you for your efforts here. Um, and I think you guys are making tremendous progress. Thank you. So I think that's all for public comments in the room. 
Sounds good. Uh, and we are only one minute over. So um, again, uh, you guys will all see our revised proposals uh, sometime before the Thursday call. And then I think we would just be prepared to, to vote on some of these issues and address those uh, few remaining topics um, uh, that we that got brought up today. Um, so until then, uh, do I have a motion to, uh, to adjourn for the day? Motion to adjourn. I think we had all three motioned at the same exact time. So I think that's probably good. So uh, I'll talk to everybody. I uh, hope everyone has a good evening and I'll talk to everyone in a couple days.